Welcome to the Adventures with Grammy podcast. I am your host, Carolyn Berry. This podcast is for grandparents on the go with their grandchildren and for parents who want to ensure loving relationships across the generations. I welcome your input and your feedback on every episode of the podcast we produce. Please send me an email at carolyn at adventureswithgrammy.com or connect with me on Twitter and Instagram at Grammy Adventure. Please follow or subscribe to my podcast. It's free so you won't miss an episode and ask your family and friends to do the same. You can subscribe to the monthly newsletter by visiting my website, adventureswithgrammy.com and clicking the newsletter sign up link. Today's podcast episode features discussion about two important childhood development issues, mindfulness and social-emotional learning. I was struck as I edited the two interviews that the three authors, Pam Siegel and Leslie Zinberg talking about mindfulness, and Judy Lawfer discussing social-emotional learning, stress the need for parents and grandparents parents to listen to their children as the key to our young ones developing and leading confident and resilient lives. After you've listened to the podcast, I'd love to know your thoughts about this and how you've seen it played out in the development of your own children and grandchildren. Pam Siegel and Leslie Zinberg co-authored the book, Grandparenting, Renew, Relive, Rejoice, 52 Ways to Mindfully Grow and Connect with Your Grandchildren. Pam is a licensed marriage family therapist in private practice in California. She also is a certified mindfulness therapist and implements meditation and other mindfulness tools to help her clients. Leslie Zinberg has a degree in elementary education and has co-written two books about parenting. She also is the co-founder of Grandparents Link. Welcome, Pam, and welcome, Leslie. Let's begin our discussion by telling listeners exactly what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is paying attention to what is happening in the present moment with out judgment. Now, I know that sounds really easy to do, but in fact, it takes a lot of practice and patience. And basically, in our book, we have two different ways of practicing mindfulness. One is formal, where you really set aside a time like a yoga session or a sitting meditation or a body scan, where you actually say, okay, I'm going to do it then, and I'm going to go inside, I'm going to listen to what's going on in my body, and I'm going to access my breathing as an anchor. And that's more of a formal meditation practice, whereas informally, you can actually just go about your day and say, oh, I'm going to be more present here, and I'm going to notice and take a breath. And that's just more informal. So both of those kinds of things are in our book, both both ways of practicing mindfulness. Now, the main building blocks of mindfulness are, which we have located in our books, and those are practice patience, there's patience, there's uh, non-striving, letting go, kindness, inner's mind. There's about 10, nine or 10 of those. And each one of those really is the essence of what mindfulness is. And so what in our book, again, we've tried to take those building blocks and use them within our 52 moments. Before we actually dig into the book, I'd like to discuss how mindfulness has impacted each of you personally. Pam, you wrote that when you were raising your children, you multitasked a lot. But now that you are a grandmother and you and you teach your patients in your psychotherapy practice mindfulness, it's impacted your life too. So I would imagine the book is one outcome of it, but how else? It it really has changed my whole life. I mean, I started practicing mindfulness and taking workshops and learning and became certified about 15 years ago, more like 17 years ago. And it has really taught me that it's not how much you can get done. It's how each individual thing, how present you are with that. So it's really all of it, the mindfulness, the yoga, everything has really calmed my nervous system. It's helped me be more present in life. 
I'm not perfect by any means, and I don't think there is such thing as being mindful all the time. When I'm not being mindful, I'm so much more aware of it. Whereas before the training, I had no idea. I didn't even know what mindfulness was. I didn't even get the idea of to actually be present. I mean, that was like a foreign concept. Definitely impacted me. What do you think, Leslie? I knew about mindfulness, but really this whole, our whole book came about because I have a website called Grandparents Link. And I asked Pam, who had small grandchildren at the time, and I knew that she was a therapist and she was working with her clients and she was working with mindfulness and she was aware of grandchildren and mindfulness. And I asked her to write an article for our website. And that article was so successful and we got such a great response from it that we decided maybe there was something here and decided to write this book. Now, the book took us a long time to write because we only met once a week because we each have, she works, I work, and we would meet on Fridays. And what happened is that we would practice the mindfulness as we were writing. And it became so strong and so appealing to me that I was learning. And each time we were working together, it's like we were having a session because we were talking about our kids, we were talking about our grandkids and how to be mindful with our kids and our grandkids. The things that were successful, the ways that weren't successful, that we, how could I do this differently with my grandkids? How could I do this differently with my children? And what this has done has made us think differently. I mean, for me in particular, I've had to, I meditate now, which I didn't do before. If I don't meditate at least once a day, you really probably don't want to talk to me because it slows me down. And what this has done is that it teaches you to do one thing at a time. Now we all can't always do that. We're not always great, but if you can pause or if you can breathe and do one thing at a time, or if you can pause and breathe before you answer a question or before you say something, especially if you are saying something that you're not sure how it's going to be taken, you have to really think about what you're saying. And that's been a big deal to us. And it's been wonderful to practice with the grandchildren because when there is a meltdown with our grandkids, we do have some tools. And that's what this book is all about is to help us with our grandkids and provide a toolbox for grandparents. Exactly right. We reinforced it as we worked on this book. And even now, just doing the talks like this, or just even thinking about our life, we really try to, I mean, I know I do, and I know Leslie does, is to just bring it into life, into our everyday life. I had been aware of mindfulness, but after reading your book, so as, as a reader and as a grandmother, it has really helped me and I'm more mindful of practicing and incorporating your suggestions into my own life and into my interactions with my grandchildren. It's been good for us. I wanted to ask you, uh, one of the chapters or one of the building blocks that I, I liked was the one about trusting yourself. And I think it's important to help our grandchildren think for themselves to help make good decisions. So can you tell us more about how we can help our children, our grandchildren's self-esteem by being mindful and practicing it with them? The biggest thing is to give your grandchildren the confidence in what they're doing and what they're saying. It's not about looking at them and saying, okay, you look beautiful today or something like that, because that's, you're talking about an appearance. What you really want to talk about is what's happening inside. If they do something particularly well, the way you answered that question was so thoughtful and talk to them and compliment them in ways that they are talking about what's going on for them. I'm constantly taken aback by the thoughtfulness and the intelligence of our grandchildren. 
when they answer a question, I think to myself, wow, I wonder if I taught my kids to answer this same way. I think that there is so much more thought and so much more input for our grandchildren today than there was for our own children. And I think that our adult children pay much more attention to the mindfulness. The biggest thing, as I said, is to build their confidence by talking to them about what they do. Pam? Yeah, I mean, one of the things too is to ask their opinion about things. I mean- That's good, yeah. One of my grandchildren saying to me, well, what do you think? What's the answer or something? And I said, no, well, what, what do you think? Like, what do you, what is your answer? And really challenging, challenging them to think for themselves. And I think that brings self-esteem and empowers them, give them positive feedback. One of the things that we've talked a lot about in our talks is to really listen, listen to what they're saying, model listening so that they listen to others and us. And if we are really in, interested in listening and that's going to help them again with trusting their own instincts, there's listening and then being interested in them. But the main thing I do think is, you know, always give them a choice too. like say to them, well, A, B or C, you get a pick. Like instead of saying, no, we have to do A, say, okay, here's A, B or C, you get to decide. And again, it's self-actualization. It's making them feel like they have empowered, they have power, they have the ability to think, and they can actually make good choices. And I think that's, that's where you go. That's where trust yourself came from. I used to do uh, that actually with my children, not realizing it was mindfulness. When they would get dressed in the morning, I would say, do you want to wear the blue pants or do you want to wear the green yes. pants or I would I would give them a choice about their clothing yeah. so I wasn't pushing things on them great idea I read the yeah. other day that instead of saying to a child I'm proud of you that we should say I bet you're proud of the way you handled that or I to help them internalize being proud of themselves is that part of mindfulness I Yes. Yeah. I yeah. think it's really important. So important. And can I jump in here, Leslie? Yeah, go. I just said, I learned this from my own therapist 25 years ago. Never, you really shouldn't ever even say to kids or anybody, I always say, oh, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. That takes the ownership off of them onto you so that they have to please you. So the best thing to say is you should be proud of yourself. And that is a hundred percent mindfulness as far as I'm concerned. I, I totally agree with that. I think it is really about letting them, talking to them and, and seeing how they feel and ask them how they feel. It makes them think and makes them feel good about their decision. And I totally, you know, I agree. I spent the past week with my younger, younger son and his children. We were snowboarding. I was watching the baby. They were snowboarding. And I had just read that, <laughs> that advice. And so when the kids would come back, I would ask them what new skill they had learned. And they would, they would tell me. And the one thing that I would make sure I said back to them was, I bet you are so proud of yourself for mastering, you know, whatever skill they told me they had learned. And you could just see the brightness on their face that they knew I was proud of them. But more importantly, they were proud of themselves. Exactly. Yeah, I always tell my grandkids to pat themselves on the back. You know, I say, take your hand and pat yourself on the back because look what you just, look what you just did. Oh, that's cool. Um, they kind of laugh at that, but they do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and that leads me into curiosity, which you said is a, another uh, one of the building blocks. Can you talk to us more about that? Well, I think when you're talking about curiosity, we're talking about curiosity also for ourselves, because if you are curious, then you are interested and you can ask them the questions because it's again, it's about what, who are they? Who are these kids? Because asking that question, like a big question, like how was your day to day? Doesn't give them, it's too, it's too wide. You have to be more specific. 
But if you are curious and you are insightful and you are asking them, what, tell me about what happened in, in PE today. Or I know you had a science class today. Tell me what happened in science today. Or if you know what is going on, for example, I have a grandson who is totally into guitar now. So we will talk about the songs that he's working on. And why did you pick that particular song? Why did you decide that you wanted to work on that particular song? Well, you know, this particular artist is my favorite artist and I wanted to work on that. And what happens with that is that you are showing your, you're curious about what he or she are doing, uh, is doing. And then they are in turn, they're asking you, but they're also curious about you. But curiosity means just looking around and being, being happy with what's, hap what's going on in the world around you. I mean, happy is a big word. So what, maybe, maybe I shouldn't say happy, but let's say you're going out on a walk. The curiosity can work on the walk. Look at the leaves, look at the sky. That sky is so beautiful today, but curiosity, I mean, encompasses all of that. Pam? Yeah, and what's coming up for me, of all that what Leslie said, but sometimes as my grandchildren get older, I see, you know, it's, it's, they really definitely change. I mean, what we were just there with our kids and my, my old, one of my older grandchildren, he's nine, he's very into this Jurassic Park game. And he is so, I mean, trying to explain it to me and what's going on. And I realize, you know, I can't put what I'm curious about. I mean, I tried and I did a lot when they were younger and exposing them to a lot of different things. And I will continue to do that, like plays and music and theater. But my own curiosity has to also go to what new things that they're learning. And I realized, I mean, I tried really hard <laughs> to sit with him and have him explain to me this Jurassic Park game, which was so intricate and you make this and that. And I was like, whoa. But I mean, again, I could be blasé and not even show any interest. And I feel like that I want to be curious. I want to show, I want to model curiosity. I'm curious in what he's doing. And as he matures and grows, I'm sure he will be even more curious about the things that I'm doing. So it's really, a, it's an interesting concept. And everything that Leslie said is right. Just stimulate discussion, talk about different things, look around. There's so many different things that we can be curious about in this world right now, for sure. It gets more difficult as the children age when you have uh -huh. so many different personalities and interests, how do you stay on top of all of them? You know, like I have six grandchildren, the youngest is only just turned a year old. So it's not quite so difficult for me yet. But I can imagine as they grow older, it will become a little more complicated. I totally agree with that. I have a granddaughter who's 12, uh, almost 13. And I see this you know, she's become a young woman and you see the difference in, and the discussions are different and what she studies is so advanced. It's important to keep up with them. You know, I play games with both my grandkids that are difficult, like a game called Roblox or another one called Brawl, Brawl Stars. I mean, ridiculous things, but I do that in order to be on their level and to encourage our relationship. But I think it's a whole different thing. And you really have to see what your grandkids are interested in because that's what they're going to talk to you about. So we, whatever it is, I find it, you know, when they spend the night here now, it's different. We used to play, you know, a couple silly little games, but now we get into serious games and the conversations. That's what's so great about playing games, I think, because if you can play a game and talk about, we talk about intention in our book, intention being, being okay, how do I want to play this game with my grandchildren? I don't want one of them, I don't want them to be talking about winning because it's not really about winning. It's about playing the game. 
But when you play the game and it becomes just kind of a natural flowing game, you find that they will talk to you about anything. It's really about, and that's the one thing that I think about these kids as they get older, it's getting comfortable with them and having them comfortable with you. And I see that with my older granddaughter where it takes her a little bit of time to kind of get comfortable. I mean, I see her walk into my house and the first five or 10 minutes are okay. And then she gets more comfortable and I get more comfortable and then everything kind of flows care, you know, flows well. And when you're doing something on zoom with these older kids, you really do have to, especially now because we're all, not everybody gets to see their grandkids. You really need to find out again, what interests them and go from there. Pam? Each, each child, as they get it, they change and their <coughs> ages grow. And I have five it, ranging from almost four to, to 10. And it's the same thing. It's each one of them is very unique. My one granddaughter is the only, I have one granddaughter and four grand, grandsons. And she's quite, there's similarities and a lot of differences in each one. You can't compare, of course, and they're each very unique and different. And you have to sort of be attuned to all of their needs and which one likes this and which one likes that. And I think actually in some ways as they get older, some of this might be even easier. I mean, I know that they get definitely more into their their friends and they get more into their things that they like to do. Like Leslie said, you can have these very interesting conversations. It's, it's more like talking to a friend or an adult in some ways. So yeah, I think it's just, it's really important for us as grandparents to really treat each one individually for their strengths and weaknesses and not, not compare. I can add one more thing. I was with my granddaughter the other day and she now can sit in the front seat, which to her is a very big deal because she feels very grown up sitting in the front seat. And I see that she wants to assist me. You know, if somebody calls or if we need directions or Although she always helped me with directions, even in the back seat, and so does my grandson. But I find that she takes on the role of being much more adult-like and loves sitting in the front and loves assisting and feeling very empowered. And that's what's pretty wonderful, is if you can add that and give them the responsibility because they enjoy that as they're getting older. Actually, that leads right into my next question, because one of the things that I personally think our society is lacking is personal responsibility and personal accountability. And with mindfulness and teaching our young grandchildren to be mindful of their actions and to accept responsibility, I think that will help our society as our youngsters age. I'm gonna answer this quickly and then I'm gonna give it to Pam. I think that one of the things that has happened with the homeschooling is that hopefully um, in most families, these kids have learned to be responsible about their work and about what they're doing. I think this has empowered them because they've had to get organized. Now I see this with my grandkids. They are very together about their schooling and they are, what they do, they're so organized. Now they're not always thrilled about doing their homework, but I will say that when it comes to school, they, this homeschooling, they are very together. They know their schedules. They know what day they're having a art class or what day they're having a science class and they are ready. And this has given them this extra responsibility and organization, which I think you have at school, but I think it's different because you're home and you really have to get it together. Pam? Well, yeah, I'm gonna go into a different way, a tactic. And that is as grandparents, I think, I think what you were saying, Carolyn, is that it's so important for us to model being responsible. Certain things, which we have, uh, we did outline in our book, grandparents saying you're sorry, 
following through with promises, apologizing if you make a mistake, don't lie in front of your grandchildren, have good work ethic, do all these things that show that you are, res- you are a responsible citizen. Of course, they're going to be looking at that. To me, that's like the most important thing. So often when kids are in, in a household that they see that, they become like that too. And then, of course, I think it's important for these kids to, to have responsibilities at, uh, around the house. Like Leslie was saying, of course, with their, their personal space, their rooms, we're getting on and on off the Zoom, you know, working with their, all their assignments and things like that. But also just having chores around the house. I've noticed oh, if they have, a, if they have a, an animal or something to have some responsibility with that. But I've noticed that the kids, they're clearing off the table. They're, they're definitely showing much more. And that maybe stems from the parents. My, both my kids are, my daughter and mom and son-in-law, they're working at, out of the house. So now they're home around a lot more and everybody has to do their share. They have to clear the table from the things they eat. They have to fix their room up. So I just think we can teach, we can be responsible ourselves, work on mindfulness, and that's being mindful as grandparents to say, okay, I'm going to show this to my grandkids. And then, of course, having them have some responsibilities as well in the house. If our Mm -hmm. listeners want to learn more, (laughs) how can they contact you and how can they buy your book? Our book, which is called Grandparenting, Renew, Relive, Rejoice, is, and it's, um, the subtitle is 52 Ways to Mindfully Connect and Grow with Your Grandkids. And the book is available on Amazon. You can connect, you know, you can buy a book that way. We are also on Facebook under Grandparenting, Renew, Relive, Rejoice. And we have Instagram on Instagram as Mindful Grandparenting. And then also I have a website called Grandparents Link, which is for all grandparents too. But, and we talk about our book also on that website, along with everything else in talking about grandparenting. Is there anything else we need to yeah. add? To that? And also, Leslie, we have our own website. Oh, yes, we have a website. It's www.grandparentingrenewreliverejoice.com. And then you can really find out about, that's how you can contact us, is through the website. Judy Lawfer is the author of several children's books and two young adult books. She draws on her life's experiences and those of her family to show us the importance of resilience and the power of a positive attitude. Set against the backdrop of the horrors of the German Holocaust and the 1956 Hungarian Revolution are the two young adult titles she's written, Choices and Hidden Pearl. Her picture books remind us of the necessity of helping our children and grandchildren to develop a healthy interpersonal skill set known as social-emotional learning. When you meet Judy, you will find that she was born in Hungary, but because of the revolution, had to flee her country with her family. I was born in Budapest, Hungary, and my parents, who were Holocaust survivors, went back to Hungary because that's the only place they, that's where they grew up. And they thought everything was over. And within a decade, Russia had taken over Hungary. The Russians had moved in and everybody was fleeing again because they didn't want to live under communism. There was a lot of anti-Semitism at the time again. And so for my parents and other people who were survivors saw a lot of the same things that were happening years ago and they didn't want to be caught in another Holocaust. So they escaped Hungary in 1956 during the Hungarian Revolution, along with 200,000 other people. So just to sort of get a context, it was amazing to me when I read about, you know, did more research to understand that number of people escaped during the Hungarian Revolution. So I grew up in Canada. I grew up in Montreal, Canada. My parents tried to get into the United States, but there was a quota at the time, and we ended up in Canada. I did. I taught kindergarten for about 10 years, 10, 11 years. And during that time, actually the focus of 
of my teaching was mostly the area of social emotional development. What I understood as I was doing my research and my studying was that kids will naturally learn. So the reading, the writing, uh, the math, that will help, that will happen almost intrinsically if children are confident. So my goal was to create confident kids by the end of kindergarten, though I did focus on obviously the academic part. A big area that I found very interesting was the whole social emotional and seeing children who were very bright and who weren't functioning well because they had no confidence. Your first book is about somebody dying. And that was because your dad died and your niece was having exactly. a difficult time with it. Right, right, exactly. So again, you know, turning to my experience in early childhood, when my dad passed away and my niece was about five, so that's a kindergartner, I realized that Perhaps there were some books out there that could help us. She was having a really difficult time, first grandchild, very connected to my dad. And I also was experiencing as well difficulty, obviously, with the grief issues and thought perhaps a book would help us. So I went to the library and looked for a book. And what I found was that most of the books were about the seasons changing or a pet dying. And there was nothing at that time. And now I'm talking 30 years ago. There was nothing about a parent or grandparent certainly passing away. Nothing that dealt with a person. I thought, well, I, there's, there's a story here. And I decided uh, one of the things that would be important for my niece to know, and I think for other people, is that the idea that even though the person's gone, the memories live on. So the major part of the story is that. It's about losing someone, but understanding that as long as you have the memories, the memories live on forever. And the book is about a little girl. And it's funny, my husband often says that the little girl might very well be me. And that could be true, because often when we go through a grief situation, it sort of touches that child inside of everyone. Yes, it's the story of a little girl whose grandfather dies and the things that they've done together during her, during her life. So the things she remembers that were fun, they got together. He showed her how to play chess and they watched, they had a dog next door and they used to look over at the dog and kind of make funny faces at the dog. And then also including some of the things that I know as an early childhood educator, and that is the children are actually very interested in the whole issue of death. They don't find it morbid at all. They find it very interesting. They're fascinated by it. They, as many of us, we don't know where people go, but young children will express those questions. So in the book, I also have that where the child says, well, where do they go? And what do they do up there? We deal with that. And the book is written in a, a rhyming text which again is the easiest way for young children to learn to read since they're able to visually see the rhyming word. I've actually made the rhyming words larger for that reason. And also they can hear the rhyming word. So now we're using two modalities for children. And is that book still available today? It is still available and it has been one of my best-selling books. It, it ended up at the Hol Washington Holocaust Museum in the museum store, which was very exciting as my father was a survivor, so of all the places that it would end up, that was wonderful. It also was on the list of uh, books recommended for childhood grieving nationally. And uh, yes, it is still available through our website on Amazon. It's actually now in its third printing. That book is published, and then you write a book about children having difficulty at night sleeping. Tell us about that book. It's a funny story because it was something that happened to me. I woke up one morning and I was laughing and my husband turned to me and he said, so you're either the most well-adjusted person or you're the craziest person. And he said, he said, everybody has nightmares, but you of course have a laugh mare. When I heard that, I thought, what a great idea. Wouldn't it be great if we could give children laugh mares instead of nightmares? Wouldn't that make everybody's day so much better? So I did a little bit of research again on the whole issue of nightmares, how children have nightmares, what some of the, uh, what some of the research suggests. And one of the things they talked about was that children have and often have, young children often have nightmares 
because they saw or heard something scary before they went to bed. And I thought, well, if that's true, the opposite should be true. I created this wonderful, magical place called Giggleyville. And in Giggleyville, you have laugh mirrors. So you can go there at night. You can stay there all night and you can meet these fun, crazy characters. It's a little bit of Walt Disney meets Dr. Seuss. So it's colorful Disney and it's crazy, zany characters like Dr. Seuss. And again, written in a rhyming text so that it would be easy. That's how uh, Giggleyville came about. And it's fun just to hear from parents when they tell me that they woke up with a laugh mare and that we created that word. So the word never existed before, right? There's no such a thing as a laugh mare, but there is now. And a fun way for children to uh, bond with both parents or grandparents or whoever is doing the reading. I like the characters' names too. Liver lips, smelly feet purple pudding. Those are fun names. Again, from my background, my teaching background, that really, that really came from that. I know they love those kinds of words. They love kind of silly, funny names. It, it provides that extra humor. The other piece was often parents would tell me that their children have, have difficulty going to bed. The bedtime is often frustrating in a lot of families. And again, my feeling is if you make bedtime more fun, and it's a place that you go together and do a little bit of bonding and read a story that bedtime becomes a little a little bit easier to deal with and children actually are happy if they can go to Giggleyville and they go there at nighttime so it's a great match we now actually have pillowcases as well from Giggleyville people can order a pillowcase and you can put it on your child's pillow it has the characters from Giggleyville and you can read the book and they can go to sleep on the fun pillowcase and all of a sudden bedtime becomes fun and that's what every child should have, a fun time going to bed. Exactly, exactly. And it is something that a lot of families battle, that whole bedtime routine. This, it seems to have helped. I've had great positive feedback from parents and grandparents. Uh, as an author, I'm always thrilled to, to hear what people thought about the story. And then you wrote a book, What's Your Birthday Wish? Tell us about that. Yes. So when Giggleyville started, I thought, well, this is a great way to deal with some difficult issues in a, in a fun way. Again, my, my idea is that life is difficult and you're going to come across difficult situations, but uh, the way, if you can find a positive way to look at them and if you can find a positive way to deal with them, that's helpful. So all of the books are some topic with a positive ending. The birthday book is pretty positive anyway, because having birthdays is great. But it was, again, from my background, birthdays are very important to children. Birthdays are, especially five-year-olds, that's a big deal. So I thought, what if we use that once a year wonderful birthday wish and help children become a little less egocentric? Let's talk to them about thinking about others. Let's talk to them about the impact they can have with one wish on the world. What could they wish for that would change things in the world? So again, written in rhyme, same as the other ones. And, and now they met some of the characters from last night I had a laugh mare. And some of those characters are also in this uh, birthday book, but they now meet a new character. And the new character is called Arthur Fish. And Arthur Fish has a birthday wish. He starts off wishing for things that are what, what everybody else does, toys and clothes and things like that for yourself. But the story moves on to let's look at some things we can wish, wish for that are really big world wishes. Like how about if we can cure all sorts of diseases? So great right now with what's happening with the virus. It's a great conversation to have. That's where the birthday wish is. And again, a way to help children in an area of social emotional development and that would be in being less egocentric thinking about others and you also have two books for older children i read about choices and having to make very difficult choices as a, a child as a young young teenager and can you tell us about that book and how it came to be that book is actually my family story. 
And I, we talked a little earlier about uh, that I was born in Budapest and that is their escape story. That's the actual, how they were able to escape with two young children. They had to really get creative in, in making it through the borders. The borders were closed at the time, so it was illegal to pass through. They had people that helped them. They had people that didn't help them. And that also sort of gives you a sense of the different types of people you're going to come across. It also is a story about resilience, clearly, about facing real adversity and how do you deal with that. When I've gone out to schools, and I do quite a bit of speaking at schools, and I've done some middle schools and a couple of early high school students, and they often are so upset about things like that their boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with them, or they they got the wrong, the, the grade that they didn't expect. They wanted an A, but they got a B. And sometimes it's so devastating and we hear all about sort of the suicide in young children that they or in teens. That was one of the things I wanted to address as well. Now, here was a family that easily could have given up. And uh, my parents could have decided that they'd had enough. They went through the Holocaust. They were both survivors. They've lo- they lost most of their family during the Holocaust. Why would they need to risk their lives again? And this time with their children. And instead of giving up, they found a creative way to make a good life for themselves and for their children. I think modeling that kind of behavior for young adults is valuable. And having those conversations about difficult times, what your difficult time would be, and I'm not underestimating that that is difficult for them or trying to belittle that, but for them to understand that in the world, you're going to face some pretty difficult situations and are you going to give up or are you going to move on? And how will you do that? And what kind of skills do you have? And what kind of attitude do you have? So those, as well as the young children's books, the young adult books also are meant to be a platform for discussion, whether it be with teachers, parents, grandparents, but certainly to discuss what they've read and discuss how they feel and discuss what they think about the characters. I read the book. I was drawn to compare it to Lois Lowry's Number of the Stars. Have other people said that to you? Yes. As a matter of fact, they have when I've gone into the middle school. So the middle schools are the ones usually reading at that level. They had read that book first. Then they, I came in and spoke to my book and the teachers had ordered the books for the kids and they did it as a, as a class. And they did compare it. That's exactly, that's exactly the book they did compare it to. If they like that story, they're going to like this story. Or, you know, Anne Frank is another one that people will compare it to, though it's about a hidden child, Anne Frank. It also is geared to sort of that young adult audience. Now, what about Hidden Pearl? Is that based on your family as well? Yes. So Hidden Pearl, so with the success of Choices, Choices won the Silver Medal Award for Young Adult Readers, which was very exciting. And, and that was my family story. But my, my in-laws, my husband's parents are also Holocaust survivors. And my mother-in-law was a hidden child. So Hidden Pearl is her story. Her name is Pearl. So she was the Hidden Pearl she was hidden in plain sight. So what I discovered in my research and doing some research on the topic was that there were two different, mainly two different types of hidden children. So there were hidden children like Anne Frank who were hidden in, a, in an attic or some were hidden in a basement. I mean, there were all sorts of, uh, of ways that they were hidden. But then there was another group of children like my mother-in-law who looked Aryan. So blonde hair, blue eyes, didn't look Jewish. And she was able to be hidden with a Polish family. So she lived with a Polish family for four years. But the interesting piece of it is she's 10 years old. She's told she can't tell them she's Jewish. She takes on a tip, completely different identity. She has a different name. And she's told her identity now is that she's an orphan. She's an orphan and her parents have been killed and she's a Polish orphan, but she's Christian. So she now has to pretend for four years, 10 years old. So imagine that, that kind of a burden for a child. 
So she now has to pretend that she's she's Christian and she starts to learn how to adapt to this family and how to make them believe that she actually knows about the religion when she has no idea about their religion. And, and she watches people at church and she follows things and she's able to hide her identity for four years. It's pretty amazing. That is. And you talk about social, emotional well-being of children, the stress that children had to endure through the Holocaust and the Hungarian Revolution is unimaginable to most children today. It is, and it's it's interesting that the students that I talk to are fascinated. They are they are really fascinated by the Holocaust. They want more information. They want more stories. They didn't know a lot about the Hungarian Revolution, so that was very interesting as well because they didn't realize that that was a pretty major event in Europe too. It was overshadowed by the Holocaust, obviously, because that was you know millions of people. They didn't know about the Hungarian Revolution, but again, fascinated by how people survive, fascinated by what all that entailed. And you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Children went through unbelievable kinds of things and had to figure out how to, how to live. I actually tutored a young boy whose father lived through that. And they had to leave Hungary because of the revolution. The father, or this, this my student's grandfather, was actually a high government official and was afraid of being killed. They had to leave to protect his life, not because they were Jewish, but because he was in the government and had to flee Hungary. And it's been pretty interesting talking to them about this as well. I love your books. I love that you have such a deep message portrayed and written in such a way that young children can laugh and feel part of the book. And thank you for sharing all of that with us. In summing up everything we've talked about, everything that you've written, what is some advice that you can give to young people and to grandparents about how to make sure that the children are as emotionally strong as they possibly can be? Thank you for sharing all that you have shared with us. And what what wisdom can you share with our grandparents about helping their young people who are facing difficulties in their lives, certainly not the magnitude of the Holocaust or the Hungarian Revolution, but are still major issues in a child's life? How can grandparents help these children to become resilient or more resilient and have the best emotional well-being they can? through stories. That's a great way to reach both the the young children and young adults. It's a wonderful way to to have discussions. And I think one of the things that's happened due to a lot of um, technology that we have, that children are often on devices. They're busy on their phone or their iPad or whatever. And they're not communicating with people. They're not talking to people. They're not listening to people. They're mo- many of them are not doing a lot of reading. And I think the, the communication has broken down. And to, to reignite that communication, a story is really helpful. If, if there's a child that gets really excited about a story, for instance, one a story about the Holocaust, for instance, which again, I find seems to really... Uh, be something that's a hook for for these kids, that it's a real opportunity to start a dialogue, to start talking to them, to start listening to them. That's another piece of what I think we don't do well, typically, and that is to listen. We do a lot of speaking, but we don't do a lot of listening. And listening to their view of what they found in the story, what were the things that spoke to them? What are the things that they can translate to present day? What would they do if they were in a situation like that? How could they handle it? Those are all things that I think are really valuable. Again, that social emotional development doesn't stop at early childhood. As a matter of fact, it just starts at early childhood. So to nurture that and to continue the, uh, the dialoguing with 
with your grandchild, with your child, they need to know that if they're worried about something or that they have a problem, that you'll listen to them, that you will help them find some creative solutions to a problem. And that to me would be a key piece to helping young adults and, and children. Thank you. I appreciate your sharing your story and your books and your wisdom with us today. Where can listeners find your books? The easiest place is on our website. So it's www.littleegg, that's L-I-T-T-L-E-E-G-G publishing.com. I also have a Facebook page. So we have Little Egg Reads. So L-I-T-T-L-E-E-G-G Reads, R-E-A-D-S. And I have an Instagram, which is at J-E Lawfer. That's in the letters J and E. Uh, I write under J.E. Lawfer. That's why my Instagram is that. They can find uh, all those links are on our website as well. The books are available on Amazon and on the website. So they're pretty easy to find. We have the, some libraries have picked them up. So they are available at some of the libraries. We actually work with two different charities and the two different charities have done some great distribution so we work with the Pajama Program, which is a national organization, and also with Kids Need to Read, which is another national organization. That is part of my whole, my focus on terms of helping uh, kids who, who don't have access to a lot of materials. I hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Adventures with Grammy podcast. You will find the links to our guests and the topics we discussed in this episode's show notes. If you would like to be a guest, or if you know someone who would be an awesome guest, please connect with me at carolyn at adventureswithgrammy.com.